hold. Okay, so Steve and Joe, we are now recording. Thank you. Well, <laughs> um, uh, welcome to GIS the Easy Way. Uh, my name is Joe Klein. I use um, they, them, or he, him pronouns, and I'm the GIS or Geographic Information Systems and Data Visualization Librarian. So GIS is my bread and butter. Um, and I'll let Steve introduce himself. Thank you, Joe. I'm Steve Kramer. I use he, him pronouns. I work with the business school, including entrepreneurship across campus, but also several social science departments and programs such as nonprofit management and the MPA public affairs program, among a few others. All righty, and today we're going to talk about, as Sam said, um, some tools, library databases specifically, policy map and simply analytics that we can use to do geolocated data um, analysis and exploration of data for places without having to install ArcGIS and a lot of GIS tools, which can be complicated or a little bit difficult to learn, um, especially if you're a student or if you are trying to teach to a class of students who aren't familiar with GIS. Um, or if you're just trying to do, you know, one simple data point analysis, like you're just trying to find, for example, where the libraries are in Greensboro. Um, you don't want to have to install a giant program and learn how to use it. So we have some tools available to help you with that. Um, but before we get started, I'm going to pause the recording or not, maybe not. I pressed pause, but it didn't pause. Very intimidating, especially some of these other tools. All right, and it is playing again. Cool, thank you. I think Steve or Sam, whoever pressed play on recording. Um, so as uh, Ignacio said, um, for uh, uh, some of y'all might not be familiar with GIS or any of this at all. So just really quickly, GIS in general is the study or the, the act of analyzing data that is related to a place. So to a location, um, for example, a state or a city or a county um, and various types of data that are associated with that. So for example, journeys that people take, um, how many people have farms in one area, uh, how many libraries are in one city or things like that. Um, and a lot of uh, uh, surveys, so specifically like the United States Census, the American Community Survey, and a lot of um, surveys involving demographics, so population information or characteristics about populations um, are reported or aggregated for geographic locations. So it is information about specific places. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So you should see a map of the United States um, and a couple of other images here. So one thing um, that these databases that me and Steve are gonna show you today, um, one thing that's kind of important to know is how they present place information. So what we call geographies. So you've got the geographies that most everybody knows. So nations, states, maybe counties. Um, so most of the United States uses counties. I think like Louisiana uses parishes instead of counties. So these are what we call geographies. And uh, the United States Census specifically designates more specific geographies that go even lower than um, states and counties. So they have block groups, or sorry, skipping a step, census tracts, which are uh, uh, smaller geographies that nest within counties. They've got block groups, which nest within tracts and then blocks or census blocks that are nesting within block groups. Um, so when I say nesting, they fit within that other geography. So it goes in order, you know, from big to small. Um, there's also a thing called the block centroid, which is just the geographic center. Um, in these database tools, you'll see they don't go as low as block group. So um, I'm gonna go back up to the definitions. So census tracts, which are the one below county level, they're a little bit smaller. They're permanent statistical divisions is the official definition of these. Um, but basically they're designed to have between 1,500 and 8,000 people and their ideal size is 4,000 people. So if you see a census tract on these databases on a map anywhere that shows geographic location, there are roughly 4,000 people in this census tract. And then block groups which nest within those tracts um, have an ideal size of 1,500 people. You won't see block groups in a lot of, or blocks, which are smaller um, within a lot of these databases because the more, the smaller geographies you get, as the more you zoom in, the more identifiable that information is. So if you have a block, which is only, for example, one neighborhood, so say you've got 10 houses in a neighborhood and one family that has kids, if you look at the census data for that specific neighborhood, for that geography on a map, it'll be very identifiable to pick out which family 
uh, or which household is linked to that data if it's talking about family information, because you know only one of those um, households has kids. That might not have made sense. Um, so basically it's more identifiable the smaller you get. So a lot of these databases will only go down to the block group level or even the census tract level. So you might not have data that zooms in far enough for what you wanna do. Um, and I believe that is what I wanted to show with that. Okay, so now that I've shown that part, I'm gonna skip over to where we can actually find these two databases. So policy map and simply analytics are, um, what I sometimes call GIS light tools. So they are databases that have data from the census, from um, a bunch of different sources. So Policy Map has some Zillow data about housing and rental in there. Um, Simply Analytics has a lot of business um, and uh, uh, market data. So they pull in other data sources, put them on a map, and then you can also upload your own data or just play with the data that they have. So in order to get to these databases from the library website, so we subscribe to these databases, we provide access to it. Um, Policy Map has some public access as well, but we have special things that we subscribe to to get you more data. So from the library website, which is library.uncg.edu, you'll go to databases in this red box, which will pop you to our A to Z databases list. And if you click on the links on this page, it basically just tells Policy Map and Simply Analytics that you are from UNCG, these are our special links that will direct you to be logged in if you have to, which gives you access. Um, so I'm going to show you policy map first, and then we'll switch over to Steve for Simply Analytics. Um, so if you click on the P, once you're in this A to Z databases, um, it will take you to a list, or you could also just search for policy map, which is sometimes a lot quicker um, because we have so many databases available. Um, I believe there might be a space in here. Whoops. And you might have to give it a couple tries. Interesting. That's weird, Joe. I don't know why. Yeah, it worked this morning. Oh. <laughs> Let me, I have this ready to go. I'm going to drop the, the, yeah. the direct link in the chat too. Perfect. Thank you. Cool. And I just found it. So I guess our search function needs a little bit help today. So if you can't find it, you can also just go straight to the P section and uh, uh, scroll through and policy map will be there. Um, and Steve has also posted the direct link into the chat. So the reason I go through the library website again is because we subscribe to specific data sets through policy map. Um, so you'll see the UNCG logo in the upper right. If you go to Google and just search for policy map, um, you won't have access to all of the different databases, even though they do have a public um, version too. So if you graduate, if you, you know, move on from UNCG, you'll still be able to access some of these, just not the specific ones we um, subscribe to. So it automatically puts me on their old version of the map, but I'm gonna show you the new version um, because that's the one it usually defaults to. For some reason, it keeps popping me out onto the, the old version. So you can tell because it's kind of a more gray color, but it looks very similar. You've got the data that's available is in these category tabs. Um, there's a tab for maps, tables, reports. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and click on this explore our new maps tab at the top which will take us to their newest version. Um, and it looks like I didn't clear my cookies. <laughs> so it's showing me uh, what I was messing around with earlier today. So let me clear all this real quick. So please hold, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so when you click on the new maps or as it should pop you out onto this new maps by default, You'll see it's a lot brighter colors. Um, it'll usually be zoomed out to the entire United States. I like to zoom into North Carolina um, and it kind of just looks newer. So you've still got these categories for data. So they've got demographic information. So categories that are in the United States Census or the American Community Survey are gonna be in here. Um, so things like population size. So how many people are in a specific county or census tract or block group. Um, you've got incomes and spending information housing, lending, quality of life, which is my favorite one because it has libraries, um, economy, health, and a bunch of other stuff too. So I believe they have COVID data in here now too. Um, so if you were interested in comparing that with some demographic information, you could do that. Um, and they also have supermarket access and a bunch of different types of things in here too, which I always find a little bit interesting. So things you might want to compare with COVID data. Um, they have suggested data sets in here. So policy map, 
Simply Analytics, a lot of the other kind of GIS light databases that have a GIS functionality are going to all kind of have a similar interface, as we call it. So they'll have a map, they'll have their data explorer, a place where you can search for data and for a location typically. And then there's different map options. So you can zoom in or out. I use the scroll on my mouse to zoom in and out instead of using the plus or minus symbols here. Um, they usually will have a base map setting. Um, so the standard base map. So if you've ever used like Google Maps or Apple Maps, you can pick whether it's a satellite view or a street map. That's basically what this does. You can pick satellite view if you prefer to do it that way. Um, if you're going to be exporting a picture of a map, you might use light because it looks a little bit prettier. Um, so that's the one I had earlier, but it's a lot harder to find stuff because it's grayscale. So um, you might want the standard so you can find places a little bit easier in the beginning. And you can always change that at any point when you're doing your work in policy map. They have a couple other features in here too. So once I add data, when you hover over it, it'll pop up numbers related to a place that I'm hovering. It can get kind of busy, so you can turn that off. There's a clip feature, which I'll show you in a second. And they also have like 3D options and rotating. Um, for example, if you've got like maybe a funky shaped county and you want it to be a portrait view when you're going to export your map for an assignment or um, for a paper or something, you might want to change how it looks so that you can fit it all on the page. Um, most people just do north up, which is the standard. Um, and there are a couple other features in here, like this reset button, which I didn't know existed until just now. Uh, and then saving. So you can save data, you can print data or print your map, you can export data. Once you actually have a data set selected, there'll be an export button. And then you can share the map image that you're looking at with somebody else too. Um, so you could embed it, you could email it. So sometimes if you have an assignment, say for um, students to go find a data set about a specific city, you could have them email you a link to that map, although they're still working on it. Um, I think that embed is the only one that works right now. So usually it's you just print out an image of the map and they can email it to you or upload it to Canvas or something like that. Okay. So that's the basics of what these will look like when you first start off. So I'm going to go to hey, it. Joe, can I stop you for a second? Sorry, before yes. you move on to the next thing, but um, can you get um, non US data? Can you get international data from policy map? Thank you. That is a great question. I am not 100% sure. I want, I wonder, I'm pretty sure it's mostly United States data. Just to double check. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is uh, just the United States. Steve, do you happen to know? I think you're right, Joe. Just the United States. <laughs> um, they, there, there's really. I, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, sorry, there's very, I had questions from this international uh, business students. There's very limited access. It seems like for mm. similar, you know, particularly uh, small area, county, zip code, census tract data equivalency for other countries so far. Hopefully that'll change soon, but right now it's hard to get that. Yeah, especially, yeah, I believe because Zillow, I think has other country information. So you'd think they would report that eventually. Um, so yes, Steve, exactly what you said is a great point. It's very difficult to compare, you know, for example, counties with entire states. So since other countries don't necessarily have the same geography structure that the United States does, it's very difficult to compare information like census data across countries um, without standardizing it somehow. Um, so I could see them limiting you to one country at a time here. Um, but that brings up an excellent point that I did forget. So thank you, Sam. Um, they have a lot of documentation. So if you do ever have a question like that, um, you can click on this support button and it will take you to a very extensive support page, um, which has just about anything you might have questions with. So if I wanted to look at like international lips, I could spell international data, and they might not have um, any things available, but you can also uh, uh, manually go through these to kind of um, see what's available. Um, they used to have a documentation page in here, but they're still in the process of updating their website. Um, so this is their new support page. Um, they also have a data directory too. So this one might have more information about specific countries that are available or specific states. Um, so it shows what year things are available in. 
still loading. Yeah, so it only goes up to nation, which to me implies they would have multiple nations. Um, so it depends on the data source. Let's look at health. <laughs> yeah, so I'm willing to bet it's just the United States. Um, as you click on things more specifically, they'll tell you more specific information about the data set, and then you can look at data sources. So most of that's going to be like CDC, United States government sources, Zillow, and a couple of other proprietary sources. Um, and if they do ever add international, they might have that um, in here too. Okay, the biggest thing, because you'll notice I'm clicking on a lot of stuff. So when you start to explore with these tools, if you're using them in classes and having your students use them, have them click on stuff. It's really hard to break this website. And if it does, you can just refresh it um, and come back to it. So click on everything you can, see what it does. Um, it can be very intimidating because there's so many buttons. Um, and I know a lot of folks, you know, don't want to click on things and uh, 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 can be very hesitant or wary to do that. But, you know, click on every single one of these and see what's in here. Um, because there are a lot of cool features and it's kind of jam packed with stuff. So one assignment that um, I know folks use with this tool is um, creating a livability index. So for one of the geography environment sustainability classes that I um, teach or, or do visits to, um, they have their students, uh, the instructor has their students find three cities and then look for factors of livability. So how long does it take for you to get to work. So what does your uh, uh, commute, commute time look like? Um, is there a hospital nearby? Is there schools or are there schools for your kids? Um, what is the income in the area? How much is rent? Things like that. Um, so different things that make cities livable. And it's up to the students to pick which factors they want so they can explore all of these different things. Again, I like quality of life a lot because they have um, libraries underneath cultural institutions. They have information from the big library survey. Um, so where libraries, museums, and nonprofit uh, uh, locations are located. So I like to click on libraries. And when I was in there, you'll notice when I, boop, 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 where did it go? Cultural institutions. Um, so there's gonna be these symbols next to the data. The old version of policy map has different uh, tabs within each of these categories for layers and points. So in GIS speak, there's different types of data. Points are, as in Google Maps, you're finding a specific business, a specific library, a specific location at one coordinate. Um, so it's gonna have the little um, Google Maps like point thing on it. And when you zoom in, it's for a specific location. So if I zoom in on North Carolina, Greensboro area, we can see the different libraries that are points at that area. Versus if I'm looking at transportation, so let's look at that travel time to work or commute time average travel time, it doesn't give us a symbol. Um, it's going to shade the map based on the geography that we're picking. So this is where those geographies come in. Um, so at the very bottom of this legend, whenever you select the data, it'll pop up a legend. Um, and I believe Simply Analytics is the same. It'll give you the year of the data that you're looking at. Um, so we're looking at the American Community Survey. So 2015 to 2019, the source is the United States Census Department or Bureau. Um, it's showing us the average commute time or average travel time to work in minutes. You kind of see the range here. Um, it's taking a little bit to load um, because I've been messing around. There's just so much data, it's taken forever. Um, you can see US data and okay, so Steve, that tells me they are adding more than the United States potentially, which is pretty cool because this is coming soon down here. All right, so the shaded by, it'll pick what geography to shade the data by or to shade the map by based on how far you are zoomed in. And this is a cool feature they just added. So you can lock it so when you zoom out, it doesn't change this. So if I wanna look at specifically cities, I want my students to pick out you know, maybe three cities that they're interested in looking at. And I'm gonna lock this so that when I zoom out, it doesn't automatically update it to state. And you can move these so that they're out of the way as well, which is pretty cool. Um, you can change the colors. So say I can't really see that purple very well on this map, so I want to change it to blue um, or even let's change it to red or pink, magenta. I don't know what color that is. Um, and you can also change what ranges. So if you notice it kind of automatically picks what data it's showing you, but say you want to see like, I want to see specifically who has like an hour long commute. commute. Um, 
And you'll see the maximum you can pick in this data set is 80. So nobody has a commute over 84 minutes, which I find unlikely, but um, that's what it says for North Carolina. And then I can kind of adjust if I wanted to do equal or you know, kind of change that. So it looks like pretty standard. I think that's between, so that's this first one. So people in North Carolina tend to have a similar commute. I cannot pronounce that word today. So I'm gonna restore the defaults to the one that it automatically selected. So I can get some more variety in here um, and make it look a little bit more, you know, darker areas and lighter areas. So it's easier to see differences. Um, it's still loading something. I'm not sure what it's loading. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to go ahead and select my cities. So they've changed how to do this, and I'm not going to spend too much more time on this. They've changed how to do this, but the basic way to do it is say I want to look at Greensboro, I can just type it in and it'll show me Greensboro NC. If I want to look at Guilford County, some students will start typing Guilford County and it won't pop up and they'll be like, eh. but if you just type in Guilford, it's because they don't put county after the name for some reason. So that's one thing to remember is try it without county first but I'm just gonna do Greensboro as a city. So Greensboro, you'll see I hover over it. 21 minutes is the average commute time to work for this city. Um, for my livability index, I wanna get a wide range of, you know, I don't know if that's livable, livable unless I compare it to other cities. So let's compare it to Durham, oops, which is 23 minutes. And then I wanna compare it to High Point, which is 21 minutes. And that one is still loading. Um, so in order to add all three of those to one area, so um, if I click on this little, it's kind of hidden by the loading thing, it'll say click to see more if you click on this little square. Um, so you can download the data, you can look at a table of this data, you can click this specific city boundary, which is pretty cool. So it only shows you what's in that map, which is very helpful for exporting the map. And then you can look at trends. So I wanna look at the table of this data. And it'll prompt me, I want to look at the average travel time, and it will show me Greensboro. Um, I believe to add places, so if I want to add High Point, it'll only do one city at a time. So you'll have to do custom regions, and there's a lot of different things that students can click on to figure out how to get um, custom regions in there. Um, and I'm going to really quick show the data loader. In the new version, you can't upload your own data. So I know, Shelly, you mentioned you were interested in putting your own data in here. You'll have to use the old version to do that, but it has all the same data, just a different user interface um, with much of the same options. And I think for the most part, that's how we use that. They have different report types like community reports. Um, so if you wanna see a community profile, for example, for those libraries that I put on the map, I could see, you know, what the demographics, age or income for people around a specific library look like or around specific like library system. Um, you can also do around a school system, around other points and things like that. All right, Steve, should we ask for questions or should we go ahead for Simply Analytics? Uh, Kimberly asked, can you go down to oh. a specific census block? So why don't you show us that, oh, Joe? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, it will depend on the data that you're looking at. So for the average travel time, it only goes down to census tract. Um, they don't go any smaller than that. Let me get rid of some of this data here. <laughs> All right, cool. So let's look at, I wanna say population because that should have um, all the way down to block group. Um, so that goes census tract and block group. And I'm gonna zoom in. So we do have our block groups here. Um, for Greensboro, you can kind of see we've got, interesting, that seems like it's backwards from what I would expect. Or these census tracts are just big. <laughs> like yeah, that like is weird, Joe. Nice. I mean, yeah. we talked about the definition of being around 4,000, give or take 500. But this is a quite a wide divergence in number. Yeah, that is interesting. So that's, again, you know, they want it to be 4,000 people. However, 
<laughs> um, and you'll see like the ones that are bigger are, they're more rural areas. So they are bigger, even though there are less people technically concentrated in here. Um, so I could also look at, you know, population density, which I think is what I usually pick. So that might be why this looks so different from what I'm expecting, because I usually pick the density, there we go, not the actual population. Um, okay. Does that answer that question? I don't think many data sets in this will go down to the block level, um, if any, and that's actually gonna be, that's one of the changes that the United States Census made in the last 2020 census. Um, they will not show you, I think even block groups, they don't really tend to show those, uh, that information at an individual level. So you have to compare multiple block groups, not look at each individual one um, by block group. And let me open up the chat for a second. There we go. Alrighty. Yeah, and if you have more questions, continue to put them in the chat and we can always email you too. Um, but Steve's gonna show us Simply Analytics. And sorry, I spent a little bit too much time on that. No, that's good. This is a challenging <laughs> topic for 30 minutes. And if it's anyone's yeah. fault for that, it's ours or mine for stressing <laughs> this in the first place. But um, if you have five, 10 minutes, please, you're welcome to stick around and we'll show you the next product. Different interface, but very similar concept. I also drop the link in the chat before I share screen. Um, so this is actually the oldest product we've had in terms of this GIS light kind of interface. And I need to choose my web browser, sorry. This one. Like policy map, you can optionally create an account in this product, which saves your searches. So for example, when I log in just now, if you're looking at my screen, you can see that it's gonna show me my last search or my last set of data that on screen. Um, and this is for a workshop I actually did for some librarians in New England. So it's showing you Medford, Massachusetts, uh, coffee consumption. That was the scenario there. Um, but normally when you start this product fresh, you see USA, I think population data. So this is not going to be look like what you're going to see when you get started. Um, it'll be more like nationwide. But let actually me go back to where we were. And just quickly compare, and Joe, please jump in if you have insights to provide regarding how this is different or similar to that of, of policy map, for example. Right, so control pan over here on the left side, you got locations, data, and businesses. That's really points data. It includes nonprofits too. Libraries are in here, um, other kinds of nonprofit locations, places of worship, for example. But locations, simply finding places, and you can see I've already navigated to Medford and we'll leave it like that for now. But keyword searching normally works fine and you can also have customized locations and favorite locations too. And But data though, let's spend a minute on this. So one way, yes, to distinguish between policy map and social explore is the additional data in this system, namely psychographic behavioral slash marketing data but it also has all of the census data, 2020 and the American Community Survey data. And actually this is down to block group level. They do additional analysis, even though the census doesn't do this anymore. This interface does its own analytics to give us census block data for almost every data point in this thing. Uh, and you can argue about the margin of error when you're looking at data down to block group level, um, which sometimes is an issue. Marketing people tend not to care, social scientists, for good reasons, tend to care more about this. But block group level is available for almost every data point in this thing. And to look at this in a, in a way that might be more useful for us as, as faculty and grad students, I'm gonna go to data folder. And this simply shows you the dozen or so kind of data sources, including the, the massage data from the analytics, but also the, the census data from 2010 to add 2020 soon and the annual and five year estimate series. When Joe showed us the data on on um, commuting packets, this was this is the data set, and commuting is in here somewhere. Commuting, to, there it is, right there. As well as some crime data and weather data, uh, COVID data too. And then I mentioned the marketing data. Joe mentioned this too. So here is where you get the fascinating, detailed, survey-based questions regarding lifestyle, consumption. Um, it's not just marketing data though. We use this for political science, social science, and research as well as for entrepreneurship and marketing, um, social entrepreneurship as well. So that's under Simmons Local. Or simply browse by these data folder categories or keyword search, whether you're looking for something like, um, let's look for, um, 
your demographic data on ancestry, Latvian. Let's see what and where in the country do we find most people who who identify or claim Latvian Latvian ancestry, for example. Or if you're looking at something more businessy, perhaps yoga. And find data on what percentage of persons in a place or number of persons in a place have done yoga in the last 12 months, among other types of sporting and exercise equipment type activity. So that's just the data example. And businesses as points data uh, searched by industry code or keyword. I search for coffee. And then each of these points on screen is showing us coffee cafes. Um, and you can see data about them. And you can also download this as a spreadsheet too. So that's the data side. And then briefly up top, as Joe pointed out, we can see the different nesting geographies, or at least black groups inside tracks, which are inside counties, which are inside states, plus their cities and zip codes. There's also um, cat options here if, to, if you want to for like school districts, for example, that's a new category um, that added to the system. And once you have picked a data point, let me just change to one real quick. I'm going to somewhat randomly um, how much people are spending on beer and ale at home, and then pick a random place and go to Seattle, see some water on screen, and then zoom in or zoom out as much as you like. I'm going to turn off the coffee because there's too many coffee shops in Seattle. It makes a mess. And as Joe indicated for policy map, we can go to the legend here and change color or customize color. And this might be more than we want to tackle in our short time today. And I know we're already running over, but like policy map, you can choose what classification system is used, which defines the color ranges or specifically the number ranges that define the colors. And for example, I'm going to do Quantas local and briefly, hopefully this will make sense. If there are a hundred black groups on screen and I have five colors here, this means I'm going to see equal numbers of color. I'm going to see 25 of the lightest green, 25 of the darkest, sorry, I misspoke, 20. There's 100 total with our, our scenario here. So you'll see 20 lightest green, 20 dark green, and then 20 of the other three colors to see the most differences. But maybe I want to see patterns. Therefore, I'm going to do natural breaks local. It'll tell us what the patterns are. Um, and we can see here what neighborhoods are spending more money than others on beer and wine at home, uh, 2020 data, uh, among other examples. And we could look at, including like income data, for example. I'm going to check my legend one more time. Quantas locals, what's coming up? And there we go. Uh, and we should add here for both these products, you can make any data on screen into tables as well. This we, we talk about mapping. I like the mapping function. I know Joe does as well. But you also can simply use this to make tables with the same data points. And just for example, a table I already had created every zip code in Florida, actually top 100, ranked by one of these things. Uh, let's do it by income. Actually, I think it already is. So these are the wealthiest zip codes in Florida, including the shown data on the value of their homes, or which is census data, um, a lifestyle statement about whether they are into environmentalism or not. That's survey data just by percentage. And then also, uh, again, there's the beer and ale at home. So anything you see on screen can also turn into a simple table or a complex table like you can see here. And maybe everyone, I should pause at this point and ask you all, what questions do you have at this point for Joe or for me? There are no questions in the chat right now. Um, and just to let everyone know, um, I did drop all the links y'all need um, in terms of assessment and where recordings live and next one's up. So, um, but if there are any questions, definitely let uh, Joe and Steve know. Okay. Let me do one more thing formally. And then I think if Joe approves, we will just leave it open to final discussion. We did promise some more examples of classroom use of this data. How, are, how what kind of assignments are being used on campus? And Joe provided the example of the GES class, which I forget what number it was, where they do livability analysis in the, inside cities, which is fascinating because partly you define what does it mean to be livable, right? And then you try to map those things when possible or get data. Um, 422, thank you, Joe, and 632. But just for example, I just have a, simple, a short word document here First sample on screen, I hope you can see this all right. I'm trying to maximize it on my screen. This is a worksheet actually for a class I teach. And this is a follow up for classroom discussion of these concepts. And I ask students to work on confirming their knowledge of how to do this. And you can see number three here, they have to go simply map. 
and choose a category, wine away from home, that's wine consumption, in this case, like bars, restaurants. This is actually an old assignment. I should probably make this 2020 now. Uh, a location, and they have to make a map using the classification scheme of Quantiles Local, like we saw ourselves do a minute ago, and then download the map. Um, as one example for them to test their skills and then a little more a um, little more thoughtful in terms of like their own critical thinking at this point in my class they have their own concept it's a nonprofit idea or a for-profit idea they're trying they want to pursue and they have to do research on this idea and i ask them here to choose that topic or some psychographic behavioral item related to their idea and then pick a place and do a uh, a map where they choose a number of persons and census tracts, not percentage of persons, so that is also an option. And then make a nice useful map that maps out the, the interest in this activity of some sort or need of some social entrepreneurship concept in that place. And then likewise, make a ranked table of tracts in the city to make sure they know how to make tables and actually see the actual numbers and not just the color schemes. So that's just one kind of a worksheet example. But two other examples here. This is uh, Political Science 630. It is the capstone course for the Masters of Public Affairs program. And Professor Allison Branwell usually teaches this class. And in this class, his teams are assigned to work on community engagement projects. And you can see that the projects here, uh, open streets, for example, and I forget what DGI, or oh, downtown Greensboro, yeah. One for Danville up in Virginia, and then one for the youth and adult engagement for the Workforce Development Office within the city of Greensboro. And without going into much detail, their job is to collect data and then make some recommendations based upon the data analysis. And so, for example, regional community health, health indicators, I would say possibly, Kim, um, and this might apply to Shelley to, uh, in some way, sociological indicators of community health, and then give recommendations to this uh, department in Danville about what they wanted to do there. And final example, MBA Capstone Course 741, uh, Professor Mike Beitler usually teaches this. They often have projects here that are either for nonprofits or have some kind of, I would say, social entrepreneurship angle. So Gallons Farms, a small startup, they produce organic waste that they collect from restaurants and other uh, food sources. So it's recycling material and then selling it as organic fertilizer. And they want to expand their services to re residences. And so I was helping this team last semester analyze what neighborhoods spend the most on lawn care and also what neighborhoods seem to care the most about recycling and environmental issues. And then using that identification of, of segments, of geographical segments or just locations to make define best markets for this recycled waste turned into organic fertilizer for gardens and trees and grass, I guess. So those are just examples of how student teams are using this kind of content as well as my example of just students having to do work that I assigned to them. So those are three more examples of different ways you can use this content. All right, and those are our examples. All right, and that is all of our prepared notes, I believe, Joe, is that correct? What, I believe so, yeah. I, so anyone, what, sorry, Joe. I did wanna point out one thing too, cause I, it just occurred to me. So a lot of these, specifically these two tools um, focus more on kind of modern or up-to-date like current data. Um, so they might go back to say like 2000 or 2010 um, and depending on what geographies are available because the geographies can change. So for example, the county that I lived in in North Carolina in like 19 whatever um, doesn't, it was split into two separate counties. So um, depending on what year you're looking at, you may have to select a different year of geographies. And if you're looking at historic data, you might have to download that separately from another archive source and then upload it and then somehow figure out which geographies it is a part of. Um, so if you ever have any questions about GIS or how to do that, especially if you want to do um, more historic kind of work, um, I'm trying to remember my link to it. I have a GIS LibGuide, um, which has how to contact me. I believe, Steve, you're on there too for the economic data. Um, or contact and reach out to your liaison librarian so we can help you um, figure out what data you need to find or work with and then how to get it into a GIS tool, including these two databases. Mm -hmm. We do have a third product that we did not choose to show you today, just because we were somewhat conscious of time, called Social Explorer. Uh, and I don't use it a whole lot, frankly. Joe perhaps does more than I do. But it does have really good historical census data back to 
to 29 to 1790 the first one uh, and there's still issues there you know counties cities states change their definitions their sizes over particularly when you go back pretty far in time so it's not always simple as we hope it would be to, to compare data but for example where where the most slaves in in the, anywhere but let's say in the South and in, in the eight, according to the 1830 census, you can look that up there among many other types of examples. So example of historical data that would not be able, you could do, you cannot do with some analytics or policy map. So that's a third choice, really focusing more on historical data using the decennial censuses back to 1790. And we actually have a webinar coming up on March 30th or a visit from the social explorer team if you're interested in learning about that. So I'm gonna paste that in the chat because um, they do have international data and more historic data. Let me add one more thing real quick. Uh, <laughs> Simply Analytics has a pricing model where the library pays for concurrent users. We pay for three users at a time. And Joe and I actually have separate accounts, so it's really it's five. But if you ever want to use this in a class, though, where everyone in the class is using it at the same time, that's easy to do. Actually, today um, I asked for 10 users. So. Uh, if you ever are in teaching a class, you want people to use this in class, and maybe there's 30 or 40, 50 students, we simply, and you can do this too, um, ask the Simply Analytics support person, who's a wonderful friend of ours named Juan Vasquez, to give us more seats, more concurrent users just for the day. And he always says yes, he's never said no. And I do this all the time, Joe does as well. So if you are using that database, Simply Analytics, and want everyone to be in it at once, that's easy to accommodate, which is a little bit of planning. Policy map has no limits though, so that, right, Joe? So that one, you don't have to worry about this, just uh, everyone can access it at the same time. And for getting extra seats too, you can shoot Steve or myself um, mm -hmm. or your liaison librarian a quick email saying, I'd like to use Simply Analytics for a class. Here's how many seats I need or how many students I've got. And we can send the request along. And Joe mentioned that that he goes and does guest teaching for classes. If any of you ever want either of us or both of us, we do that too sometimes, don't we, Joe? Um, to lead a workshop, a hands-on workshop regarding how to do some of this work, please let us know. We were happy, it's part of our jobs and we really enjoy uh, working with faculty and working with students. So please let us know if either one of us can come and support your students or just support them outside of class as well. And thank you for coming. Yep, any final questions or comments? As people might be putting their final questions in the chat, I do want to out loud say that um, there's tons of links in the chat that I don't expect everyone to hit all of them. But um, just so that y'all can verbally hear it, there's um, the two spring webinar series from the libraries are coming up. Um, so pay attention to your inbox from uh, Campus Weekly as well as your liaison librarian. But the first one coming up in online learning and innovation is on inclusive teaching and um, practices with Rob Owens, the ITC from the Bryan School. I think it's going to be um, really great. So that's on February 10th at 12 p.m. And then the first one coming up in the research and application series, which is on, you know, library stuff, research stuff, is on January 20th at 12 p.m. on closed versus open public publishing, what are the options, how do I choose, what support is there, um, by Anna Craft, who does a lot of our scholarly communication stuff. Um, so are there any questions for Joe and Steve? Otherwise, thank you all for being here today. Hope this was useful. Uh, please let us know if we can support you. Joe, have you shared your email address yet? Not yet, but I will type that into the chat. I, yeah, I couldn't remember if you had or not. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and we hope you all have a good and safe spring semester. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your week. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well designing classes, doing our stuff. So see you all soon. Thanks. Yeah.